So, Dennis, good good afternoon. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Yeah. So I was saying that we have uh, Sebas that did the revision of all the chapters in the translation. He's going to be Ben here with us too to answer something about the the platform that you have online about the education and you are going to talk about the the book and and yeah all you want everything you want to say about all this thing that is happening in Latin America and biodynamics. Hello everyone. I was asked how do I have the patience to do this kind of work? Um, first off, I'm 78 years old, so when you get old, you better have patience because you get a lot of time on your hands, and uh, and and that's been good for me to do the research that I've uh, I've been doing research my whole life on these things, but since I have retired, I have uh, time to go more deeply into things. And um, what I've recognized over the years is that there has been a change in the way biodynamics is seen in the world. I'm old enough to have known people who have known people who were at the agriculture course. I had friends when I was younger who were young people at the agriculture course. Yeah, they were older than me, but they were my friends and they were there. And they said that at that time, uh, the farmers who were present there um, were scratching their heads about <laughs> what Rothstein was saying. And uh, some of them were actually upset about some of the things that he said. Yeah, they felt like, um, especially with the preparations and things, that it was black magic. And uh, they were not happy that he didn't uh, talk about the problems that agriculture was facing due to machinery. So there was a kind of joke that was said uh, that they came to Rudolf Steiner and said, we don't like our tractors. We hate our tractors and they never work. They said, we love working with our horses. And when the day is done at the end of the day, we thank our horses for the work they did. And the story goes, he smiled and said, why don't you thank your tractor? Why, why don't you what? Thank your tractor. Wow. And uh, that pretty much is a picture of Rudolf Steiner. He, he was saying, in essence, that even in the tractor, the elemental beings need to be acknowledged. And he was speaking about elemental beings in a context that in Europe at that time, there was European shamanism that was part of the agriculture world. As a young man, he could see the elemental beings and felt that something was wrong with him. And then on a train, he met an herb gatherer who told him, no, you're, what you're seeing is a reality. Yeah. Rudolf Steiner was concerned that uh, he was... Uh, loco en la cabeza, okay. uh, because he could perceive these other forces. And the herb gatherer said to him, no, what you're perceiving is a reality. And there's something in that quality of Rudolf Steiner that has been removed from biodynamics. And the also the alchemical work that Rudolf Steiner did, even with Ita Wegman, um, is not considered to be valuable in some biodynamic circles. And uh, for me, uh, I don't see elementals, uh, but I always have understood that there is 
a way to understand that world. And Rudolf Steiner has given indications of a way to do that because he told the priests at the, at the time of the agriculture course, uh, Rudolf Steiner was giving three different impulses. At the time of, in 1924, Rudolf Steiner was giving lectures on biodynamics. He was giving lectures on curative education, and he was giving lectures to the priests on uh, the founding of the Christian community. All at the same time, uh, at the time of the agriculture course, he finished the agriculture course, got on a train, and traveled all night to go to another country to found a home for children who were at risk. So that gives a picture of the man uh, that um, his concern was that the natural world be perceived in in a whole, a whole way, W-H-O-L-E, a whole way that the elemental world can be perceived in a contemporary sense when we pay attention to one, according to Rudolf Steiner, uh, numbers, and two, planetary activity. And uh, he said numbers is not computation. It's more the sacredness of numbers, uh, the difference between one as the uh, originator and two as the reflection of the original. One and two have a baby and that's three. And the baby number three grows up to be an individual, that's four. This is the nature of number in the old world. You can draw what I just said with a compass very easily. And it's the basis of the geometry of the bees. <laughs> it's sacred geometry is number. And if you see number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as a musical octave, you get the planets. And if you begin to look at those numbers in terms of planets, you begin to understand the sun and the moon and how they influence things in life. I spent 30 years of my life studying numbers in that way and weather, and in the process saw that rhythm is the basis of all life. And if you, if you begin to study it, study nature that way, you're always surprised at what you don't know. And what you don't know is much more important for your study than what you know, because that gives you the patience to keep doing it. And if you give up because you don't know, you'll never know. <laughs> and so nature teaches us by um, what, what could be called scaling, S-C-A-L-I-N-G, making scales. Everything is harmonic to everything else, but at different scales. And what I've found over the years, if you can have an appreciation of the rhythms, they will show they will be a door to a whole other way of looking at nature. So something that I've found that I've never found in other places that I think is really useful for biodynamics, is the length of day. Length of day is the rhythm of the sun. And through the year, it uh, changes, the sun changes one degree of uh, longitude every day. And that's, uh, that is the timekeeper. It is the basis of the music of the spheres. And it regulates seasonal patterns and the growth of plants and migration of animals and the moods of humans. And if you pay attention to it, you can harmonize your own inner life 
with that rhythm of the sun because the change is so regular that it allows you to set up experiments where you can watch that happen. So if you take the length of day at the equinox, that means equal day and night. And between the equinox and a solstice, every day there are a minute of change of time going towards the solstice. And then from the solstice going towards the other equinox, there's less one minute a day going down the other way. And there's a great secret in that. If you watch when the leaves fall off the tree and you wrote down the length of day on that day, and you looked at that same length of day on the other side of the solstice, you would see that that's when the buds broke to form that leaf. In the spring, at a certain length of day, the bud breaks, and in the fall, that's on that same length of day, the leaf falls off because there's a new bud forming. And if you don't know that, And you're out in nature, you say, oh, the leaves are falling. Who cares? And the only time you care about the breaking of the bud is if you grow wine. So watching something like that, uh, there are places where um, you can get that information uh, of the length of day in your latitude and longitude every day. Here in the U.S., I use uh, what's known as the Naval Observatory um, ap- application for length of day, solar length of day. And you need yeah, to put in your latitude and longitude, yeah, and the computer that? will figure out the exact length of day at your place. And that is an elegant combination of number and planet. And if you wish to actually make it a science, you have to record your observations of your bees or your animals or your plants on a a calendar where you also have the length of day. And if you do that, you can go back through years and watch the exact length of day for a particular plant that begins to form a bud and then breaks it and then flowers and whatever. If you want to know when the forage for your bees is going to be available, you can do that and with very uh, amazing precision. But you need to keep your own records. And for me, that's what is the way in which the alchemical work can be brought into uh, a scientific perspective. And when you do that, nature appears to be much less random. You begin sí. Azarosa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you begin to see what Rudolf Steinway called secrets or mysteries or even imaginations. And those imaginations in time, that is the elemental world. And that part of biodynamics used to be part of the work. Originally, the biodynamic journal up here always had um, articles about moon moon rhythms and things. The men and women around River Steiner were very, very keen on studying nature that way because they couldn't see the elementals either, but they wanted to study them. To, to people who don't see that way, the elementals are rhythmic, patterns in unfolding in the natural world. And and over time, over time, that quality of the work in biodynamics gradually started to recede into the background. And the people who did the work uh, began to try to use the methods of natural science as a way of proving the subtle influences in biodynamics. And those uh, methods of natural science are kill it, burn it, and analyze it. And when you've killed it and burned it and analyze it, you know a lot about the corpse, but not much about the life. Because the life is the rhythm that made the thing what it is. 
Rudolf Steiner had a funny way of saying that. Rudolf Steiner tenía una manera chistosa de decirlo. He said certain parts of natural science today are like a flea on a corpse. And the flea is a little scientist that has a little pick. And the flea goes up to a bone of the corpse and takes a little piece of the bone of the corpse back to the flea laboratory and then pronounces what the life of the corpse was from the little piece of bone. So that's why Rudolf Steiner didn't call biodynamics bio corpse. It's not a corpse. It's a it's a dynamic. It's a sequence of rhythms. And natural science recognizes those things, uh, such things as the electrochemical series is uh, an example where one uh, metal becomes another metal, becomes another metal in the in an exchange. So potassium seeks to become sodium, seeks to become calcium, seeks to become magnesium. This is called the reactive series. And potassium and calcium interacting in the earth body makes gems. Potassium and calcium interacting in the soil solution attracts, is attracted by the root hairs of a plant. Potassium and calcium reacting in the sap of the plant is what creates the rhythms of the forming of the leaves and the flowers. Potassium and calcium in the stomach of a cow that eats the plant is allowing the cow to digest the plant. Potassium and calcium in the cell of the cow that ate the plant, that ate the mineral, is forming the nutrition for the cow. And natural science today would say potassium and calcium in a mineral have nothing to do with that in the cell, unless you think alchemically, and then they are all part of a whole. I've put articles online for many, many years, and a scientist would read them, and it was always some scientists who would criticize me for saying that calcium and potassium in a gem have something to do with calcium and potassium in the mitochondria of a cell. And they would say they're in completely different realms, so they don't have anything to do with each other. And that's the death process of contemporary science. So Rudolf Steiner has said, no, 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 that is, um, we need to bring it back into wholeness again. And we can best do that when we see uh, that number and planetary patterns somehow are images of the things that are in the world. Spiders and honeybees know that. Rhythm, harmony, geometry, planetary movement. So if you begin to study this way and take records, um, it's not a question of having the patience to do the research because you're always being led to something you don't know. And that is the basis of research. This is what Rudolf Steiner is called mystery wisdom. In the old days, they called it the harmony of the spheres or the music of the spheres. People don't have the patience to do this because you don't get answers right away, but you get a lot of questions. And the only way to solve questions is to get better questions. And once you find that your questions are, are not quite in line, it helps you refine your mind to go towards a better question. And approaching nature with real, true, and honest questions, it's much better than thinking you're approaching it with answers. Yeah, answers are recipes. Just tell me the recipe and don't make me think. But the, the recipe deadens your, your um, curiosity. And the only thing that keeps humans growing is their interest in revealing mysteries. Yeah, there's an old saying among the alchemists that the old people sought to reveal the mystery and the new people want to solve it. 
what they say is if you try to solve the mystery, you want to kill it. So the ability to stay in what's known as an open secret is um, the idea behind the renewal of biodynamics. Okay. And that, you that, that's stay <laughs> in a question that's open for a long while. Because the recipes in biodynamics are preventing it from spreading out into away from Europe. You you don't have the plants down in Argentina or Venezuela or Ecuador that you have in Germany. And you're working with completely different solar and lunar patterns of rhythms in the different hemispheres. So in order for biodynamics to grow, it needs to go into the world where you people are. But it needs to be fertilized with what you can find out by being where you are. And and there, I could say, we get to traditional practice. So I often say that when I uh, do the work I do with mandalas of uh, hot, cold, wet, and dry, people in the third world will have no problem with that because that's the basis of traditional medicine and agriculture traditionally and from my travels and talking to people i realized that a large part of the world still works that way and that's not a liability that's not a problem working that way is not it's actually a doorway to finding out new things and it needs to happen because next year is a hundred years since the agriculture course. And uh, the wisdom that goes that Rudolf Steiner said to people around him, I want to tell you something. Please don't talk about stuff that I said until you understand it. And he also said that after a hundred years, everything I said needs to be changed and brought into a new place. And that's a rhythm, isn't it? And so here we are at the threshold of a 100-year anniversary. And the question is, can we move it down the field or is it going to be just recipes? And it's not possible to do this if you don't keep records. You have to practice keeping records, especially in the context of the length of day. Otherwise, you know, you forget and then you make stuff up. And he asked somebody, well, hey, it's raining a lot. And he asked an old farmer, yeah, I think it was 10 years ago. It was like, uh, yeah, or, I don't know, 11, 12, I don't know. Some, it was, it was a while ago, but that doesn't, that's not science. Yep. Time is, that's right. Time is the great mystery. Yeah. And uh, as, as biodynamics unfolds, the qualities of time and rhythm of time will lead you to understanding the plants and animals that are around you in a better way. Because time and space are a kind of weaving that happens. Time, space, time, space, time, space, time, space. And that That's a plant. I put out a leaf at a time and then a space and then a leaf and then a space and then a leaf and a space. And it takes a certain amount of time to do that. How many days does it take for a queen cell to emerge into a queen? Time and space. How long does it take for a seed of a medicinal plant to germinate? I just had an experience with my favorite plant is Helichrysum italicum. And I, I grow it from seed every year. It's a remarkable healing plant and I distill the oil from it. And if I take the seed from one grandma, I call her Oma, uh, yeah, the abuela, she's the grandma. But if I take that seed from the grandma and I germinate it, I get five or six different types of helichrysum. And some of them are fragrant and some are not. And some of them grow well and some of them can't stand the heat. So I go out every day and I pinch the grandma and smell it. 
And then I go to the babies and look for that smell, aroma. And that aroma can change day to day, week to week. And if I keep records of it, I have a picture of how that abuela is going to influence the little ones. So this year, from the abuela, I have the seeds that I put in 42 days ago. And I watered, I sprayed them and misted them twice a day for 42 days, and they didn't germinate. And I thought they died. And then just the other day, I went out and one of them germinated out of 100 seeds. And guess what? That's the new abuela. It's got the power. And then I went and checked my records, and it turns out that they germinated on the length of day when the buds form in the spring. So I forgot what I already knew. And the only thing that saved me was that I kept records. Otherwise, I'd go, what's going on? So the fact of being able to track the uh, when the buds first form, I write it down. When the buds open, I write it down. When the anthers form on the flowers, I write it down. When the fragrance grows on the flowers, I write it down. When the oil comes off, I write it down. Yeah, so it's not making things up. The problem with the whole elemental world is people go, you're just making this up. What are you talking about? Little men with little funny shoes? Is that what you mean? Elemental? And that, that's not what the elemental world is. The elemental world is the rhythm of the weaving of time and space. And the plant reveals that. The bees reveal that. I met a man who did a study of great trees, big trees. And he was studying uh, oak trees where he lived that had branches on them that were this big around. And they were in his uh, back uh, behind his house. And he went out in his yard and he took a stick and made uh, markings on it and buried it in the ground next to the branch. And he went out four times a day and measured it. And what he found was every day that huge branch is going like this, up and down and up and down and up. It was, it was breathing, it was <laughs> moving up and down along with the movements of the moon and the sun and the elemental beings. It's studying rather than just trying to apply a recipe. So the, in, in my understanding, the future of biodynamics is people in countries other than Europe doing research. And it doesn't have to be high tech at all. When I take people out into my quote laboratory, they laugh. <laughs> they look at it and say, you got to be kidding. Because the laboratory is in the soul of the operator, the alma, the mi alma, is the rhythm of the world, the world soul, the soul of the soul, is the is the soul of the world. That's the dynamic of the world. Is a dynamic soul force of time and space coming together. And this has a great deal to do with even what the minerals are in the soil where you live and the insects and things that come and visit the plants and the uh, elevation that you live, where you live. Yeah, and there are many, many things that can be done that would be very interesting experiments that would enhance the work in biodynamics. I heard of an experiment that was done in Costa Rica about dandelion. They were trying to use dandelion to make the preparation. But uh, in the jungle area where they lived, the dandelion wouldn't grow. But they would have to go up in the mountains at 3,000 feet, and there the dandelion could grow a little bit. So they went up to the mountain and got the dandelion and brought it down and planted it 500 feet lower. And they waited for that to go to seed. And they took that seed and germinated it and planted that 500 feet even lower. And they did that until they had dandelions that they could grow down below that would go into seed that would they could propagate. 
This is rhythms of time and space. Yeah. So it's my understanding that in Rudolf Steiner's work, he was very interested in how number and planetary influences come together in the natural world. So I don't know if uh, down in the countries where you live, uh, there is a version of the Stellanatura star calendar. The Stellanatura uh, is a calendar that is made from, uh, according to biodynamic principles, that has the date and the rhythm of the planets and then a space for work notes. And so in order that you don't forget what you've observed, if you keep uh, writing on a calendar like that, after a while, I have a collection, I go back 20 years of st of still on the tours. And when I want to find something out, I just spend an hour or so going back th through all the calendars and see is there a rhythm. So right now, Alex Tukman, uh, the beekeeper for um, uh, here in the States, is in charge of that, making that calendar. And if anybody had an interest in doing that work, they could contact Alex and see what he could recommend. I know he uses the Naval Observatory as the basis for making the calendar. Yes, Alex's last name is T-U-C-H-M-A-N, Tukman. And he's a wonderful guy, he's a beekeeper, and he's now in charge of uh, Spikenard Bee Farm. And it is a very bright man who has agreed to take that work on. It would be great if somebody down south of the equator could make a calendar for your area. Yeah, I, I think there's, I, I've seen some from South America. I don't know who's doing that, but I, I think there's there's some. And I would think that that would be a very good basis for uh, a lot of conversation uh, among the people who are working down there. Right, but it, it would be a conversation that would be based on fact rather than, yeah, I think it was maybe, you know, whatever. The because if you're talking to a scientist and you say whatever, they know that you're not really serious <laughs> about what you're doing. But what I've always found is if there is a scientist who has questions, when you speak to them about things like this, they are, they show interest. If they, they're a scientist that is more about answers, then they're not interested. But if they have questions, they've seen something they don't know or don't understand. That's... And Goethe's famous quote is, you never go farther than when you don't know where you're going. Because you try everything. If you think you know where you're going, you just go there. But you only find things you already know. And then you lose patience. So if you want to keep interest, you have to have questions, not answers. And you know, the countries that I saw going through here, Ecuador and Peru and whatever, you have a wealth of natural phenomena that could really inform biodynamic work. Yeah, you would just have to base it on something that you would be a common language, I could say. And the common language of the elemental world is number and planetary influence so we just made a circle there yeah so that's what keeps me going is that i always am surprised when things go wrong like my my holy chrism who did in germany for 42 days and the seeds are about, are about the size of a piece of pepper you know that they, they're like nothing and I'd go out and spray them and I'd look and I wouldn't see anything for 42 days. I was like, what happened? And now that one has germinated at the time of the bud set in the spring, now I know when to sow them next year. And that's the way plants teach us things by not cooperating. <laughs>
They teach us by by not doing the things we expect them to do. And they say there's no such thing as a sick plant. There's just a stupid gardener. <laughs> the plants are just unfold. And there's something called the soil clock that I found. The soil clock is when you disturb the soil on a yeah on a particular day, that planetary uh, pattern gets fixed in the soil. So if you want to see that, then um, have some lettuce plants that you start. And when all the little lettuces are about the same size, you can do an experiment. Or it even works really well with radishes. And so on the day of an eclipse, you transplant some of the lettuces. But the other lettuces you transplant two weeks before the eclipse. And watch what happens. When you disturb the soil on the day of an eclipse, those lettuce plants, you're telling them, I think you need to die. And that's okay with lettuces, but suppose you choose that day of an eclipse to plant a couple of trees in your new apple orchard. Guess what? Not going to work well. Planetary movements, rhythms, time sequences. And those things are specific to your latitude and longitude. And it's my understanding that that will make your work in biodynamics scientific. If you keep records and pay attention to planetary rhythms and numbers, you will have a scientific basis to be able to talk to scientists uh, about biodynamics. There are some days when you can do things in the laboratory and some days where you can't. There are some days when you can do things in the garden and some days when you can't. Anymore, I never disturb the soil at any time between eclipses. What I fix into the soil for those two weeks just doesn't want to unfold anything in the realm of plants. And it's the same making wine or fermenting or making a spray or burning things or making incense or whatever. That kind of consciousness is a consciousness that can carry biodynamics uh, into the next hundred years. Yeah, you won't be able to compete with science by reductionist methods, but you can learn an awful lot by paying attention to number and planets. So that's what I do, and I hope that this was helpful for you folks out there. And that's the reason why I wrote that book. Ah, uh, yeah, global warming, absolutely. So that global warming is going to change the whole picture here. That's why we have to do this work, is say, what's happening? What's happening with these plants? What's happening with the bees? What's happening with the forests? Is there a possibility to do biodynamic work on the Peruvian jungle? Sure. Mm -hmm. You just have to understand your rhythms that happen. And they're more subtle. So when you get below 30 north and 30 south, the day-to-day -day rhythm is uh, a lot less uh, dramatic, we could say. But it's there. It's okay. The fact that you live in the tropics uh, makes it a little more difficult to see of the length of day because the increments are smaller but they're there otherwise you wouldn't have a winter and a summer you said that's, that's interesting hi in your book agriculture sacred agriculture sometimes the images are repeated is that have any motivation sure the that's the way i teach Okay. Everybody who's been in my classes, I say I repeat things all the time. But you know, 
Fum, fum. <laughs> so you say things, they go, what? That's, <laughs> so you repeat them in a different way. That's the way I, that's the way I work. Sí, that's the way de... nature works. That <laughs> one leaf, another leaf, another leaf, another leaf, you know. So everybody saying like, "Wow, you are amazing! Your your book, your articles that you write, I'm I'm fascinated with the rhythms of the sky. Very nice representation of the dynamic of life. So so everybody loves you, Denise. <laughs> Back at you, yes. Thank you. Yeah, it's important that people in other countries take up the work or else biodynamics is will just die a formal motif is how uh, so mint a mint will grow by putting out opposite leaves on a square stem that's a formal motif a parsley grows by uh Yeah, a parsley grows by forming a rosette one year and then shooting up into flower the next year. That's a formal motif. And every formal motif is a picture of a time and space pattern, a rhythm of time and in space. So a plant is a picture of things moving through time and space. And the way it does it is the motif of the form. So it's a representation of what is the species is experiencing in, in space and time, right? You're saying that the formal motif. Yeah. So you what you think you're seeing is a plant, but it's not. <laughs> okay. It's the wake of a plant so a uh, ship goes through the water you see what we say here we say the wake uh, okay the, the lines that that led behind that it the... leaves in the water okay yeah and the plant you see is the wake of the living plant the plant you see will die when the living plant goes back in into potential and and the way in which the plant comes into being and goes away you can work with that uh, very well so i'll give you an example i collect maple leaves and in the spring the leaf is forming when the bud shoots the green wood is shooting with forces that want to form leaves and if you harvest those young leaves and ferment them you can spray that ferment onto plants that you want the leaves to unfold but in the fall the quality of the light has changed that leaf the light all summer has changed the chemistry of the leaf and the that same maple leaf in the fall is has changed in chemistry to send what's in the leaf to form a bud so if i took the juice from the spring when the bud is breaking and making leaves and i sprayed that on my cabbages they would have a tendency to want to just go and open up but if oh, i take oh, the oh. leaves of the maple in the fall and ferment them and spray on the cabbages they are being told form a bud form a head don't go and open up go the other way and the difference in that leaf has to do with the length of day in the spring and the fall so that's an example a practical example of how you can play with these things so somebody is asking here that if there is a chance that you write a book called este ganaderia sagrada like with animals no nah, <laughs> i'm a plant guy 
I like animals, but I don't. I don't. I don't have the space, and I'm too old to tend a cow. I can tell you. And they ask, uh, "What is the role of animals in agriculture?" It depends on how how many animals you can have, and there's a whole science of it that I I don't work with. I just don't. I don't work with them. I I can't get cow manure. So I make false manure. I get alfalfa pellets and I ferment them with um, fermented maple leaves. And See. that's my manure. And I can tell you, when I put it out, the neighborhood thinks a cow just went through and pooped. Good. Goes in the soil and boy, the worms love it. I think there's a few more questions, but if you have questions, send them in. I'll try to see if I can find resources. Yeah, these are technical questions about the precession of the equinoxes. I, you know, it's when you open this door, there's a huge world of potential for study. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Gracias. Thank you so much, Denise Mar Martin. Ben, gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Bye.